I'm joined today by Angus Forbes. Now, Angus is an Australian-born former investment banker and hedge fund manager. We actually met at Merrill Lynch mm -hmm. uh, almost two decades ago. <laughs> uh, now, something I've always personally admired about him is his support to women. He's championed his wife, Darcy Bustle, and his two daughters over the years and is pro-women's rights, so I'm so delighted, Angus, to have you here today. Thanks, Daz. Okay. Now, over the last decade, I just want to share a little bit about why he's here. He's focused on becoming a leading cha campaigner for the environment. Global Planet Authority is his life's purpose right now. So, Angus, over to you. Tell us, what is it about? Thank you very much, Taz. Great to be here. Um, Vote GPA or Global Planet Authority is um, what I believe humanity needs to do in order to save and protect the biosphere. Um, it's a global asset, so we need to go into the global governance space for the first time. It's a void, no one's there, we, humanity hasn't entered it. Um, but in order to protect our most valuable asset, in order to shoulder our most, um, our greatest intergenerational obligation, we need to enter that void now and create a global planet authority. It'll be an authority that delivers us, delivers us a function of utility, and that is biophysical integrity. Um, it's quite extraordinary that we have to stop for a moment, I think, as a human race. We're up to almost 8 billion, and we now run the biosphere with Mother Nature. For the first time in humanity's history, we've got into that position of power. We could, for example, take carbon dioxide in the troposphere to 600 parts per million and warm the planet by five degrees. We could probably concrete over the Mediterranean Sea. We could probably reduce the Himalayas to rubble. So from this point on, we are now in part charge of the biosphere. And we have no authority or institution capable of keeping us out of nature's way for the next 1,000 years. So we have to create it. It is a, an amazing time actually to share this space with you, given everything that we're starting to focus on with respect to the environment. I mm -hmm. mean, we've just bought our first electric car, mm -hmm. my children driving that decision on being adamant that we cannot buy another petrol or diesel car whatsoever. Yep. We've heard you know, we've seen little girls such as Greta Thunberg to David Attenborough's recent um, documentary yeah. that was aired. Yeah. We've even got Leonardo DiCaprio, a huge advocate mm. for the environment, coming out with his second film. <coughs> Tell me the timing, Angus, and how critical that is at the moment. So I think um, uh, to lines have effectively just crossed um, if you graph them. One is the recognition that we run a biosphere. And in modern parlance that you could argue that started with Rachel Carson's Silent Spring in 1961. Um, got, went through Gaia theory, Earth systems analysis, through Blue Planet 1 and Blue Planet 2 as you just mentioned. So we now know our potency. We've halved the rainforest, We've removed 80% of the original forests in total, and of course we're making species extinct. So fact number one is that 60 years after Silent Spring was written, we know, we know now we run a biosphere and that isn't going to change. Can I just, sorry, sure. I want to ask you on this, because I get confused mm. when there are certain people who are leading government Mm. who are still in denial of climate change. Okay. And I'd love to know what you would have to say to them. Um, I think, um, I don't think there's actually a lot of denial. Uh, I really don't. Even Donald Trump has said that it's probably true. But there's a choice you have to make as the head of a nation state between prosperity, the environment, planet, um, etc. You've got to decide. Just in Australia's elections that occurred a few days ago, the person that 
wasn't expected to get up was the Conservative uh, Scott Morrison. And he won by simply saying, I'm going to protect your jobs and we're going to still continue to export coal. Whereas the Labour government said, we're going to go to 45% renewables almost, and that questions coal mining in Australia. So there's this continual um, tough decision to make if you're the head of the nation state. And that's why we've got to remove it from that, from the nation state. The nation state at 197 nations is too fractured and disparate to be able to take these decisions. We never designed a nation state system. I and mean, you and I have created nation states. Our forebears created the nations very recently. We never designed them to protect and enhance a biosphere from 8 billion of us. So they're simply putting a round peg into a square hole. It doesn't fit. So the people who are at fault is actually you and me. Because the head of the nation state cannot deliver us the function of utility that we must have. Because they're on three, four year electoral cycles, and yet we need 100 and 500 year decisions to be made. We need to separate that function out. We need to go into an evolution of governance. We need to move up to the global sphere. If you look at football, 200 years ago, it had no lines on the pitch, no referees, but now we have FIFA and we all celebrate the football pitch, the netball court, the, the oval for cricket that we see because they run globally. No one is in charge of running the biosphere for us and we have to separate that out. So against that first curve of understanding that we now run a biosphere that started in 1961, the second curve has just intersected it, and that is our connectivity. So Berners-Lee wrote HTML in 1989 and gave us the World Wide Web. And at the end of 2018, four billion of us are connected to each other through smartphones and, and the web. And at the end of 2022, five billion of us would be, will be. I contest that five billion of us can, will be connected global citizens. So if we choose to enter the void of global governance, which I believe we must do, we can now do it. Because our most populous nation state is China at 1.38 billion, India at 1.33, the largest national election is 800 million in India, and an equal second place is Indonesia and the United States at just 140 million. So if one and a half or two or two and a half billion of us decide to go and hold a vote to enter global governance, no one can stop us. And I believe that the commonality of the degradation of the biosphere and that intergenerational obligation is what will unite us to affect that. Although, I mean, you brought up Australia. Mm -hmm. They've just voted for the guy yeah. who is supporting profit over environment. Mm, yes. So how can you galvanise those numbers, particularly when a lot of the countries most affected by climate change are also some of the poorest? I think that the, um, it's about, no one likes a cheat. And we all obviously slightly um, act in our own self-interest. I think the problem is, is that with regard to the biosphere, if, if someone's cheating on something else. So the Indians and Chinese are the worst with regard to soil erosion. But US is up, USA is up there. The country of my birth, Australia, lo has lost the most species per capita of any country in the world. And you can go round and round and round and everyone's guilty of degradation of the biosphere. So if the proposition is this, let's outsource it to our first global authority that puts down the rules for everybody Everyone in the world will face a global carbon tax. 60% of the oceans will be man free. The rainforests will be held under global protectorate. So the boundaries of the biosphere are put back in place. Then we can all play as competitively and as hard as we want with our self-interest or possible motive or whatever, as long as we're on the playing field. The human brain is incredibly efficient. We continually pursue efficiency frontiers. What's in my best interest? How long is this interview going to go on for? Um, where's, where am I going to get my sources of water and food? How is my source, am I going to procreate? We're continually computing these every single day. But our brains haven't heard an efficient solution for the biosphere that is effective, that is strong, that will win. And that's why I think we're a little confused. 
I believe that if you're given the opportunity to vote, to allocate part of your personal sovereignty so that the whole of humanity enters onto the same playing field and that we protect the biosphere, we'll all do it. Tell me more about sovereignty. I mean, you've just mentioned a couple of taxes that might be implemented should GPA come into manifestation. Mm. So how do you hold nation states accountable? Well, the moral right of enforcement comes when a quorum of individuals allocate personal sovereignty in order to make the authority exist. And, and the reason why we know that is that that is the function that we've done throughout the ages. We did it when we formed into a village, it may be in the 15th century, the formation of sewage works and a sewage works authority, the formation of Lower Saxony, Louisiana, New South Wales, and then when we formed our nation states, United States in 1776, Chile and Argentina in 1810, uh, Canada in 1867, South Africa in 1910, etc. Those were all the same functions. I allocate part of my personal sovereignty in order to abide by the rules of the authority that we've created, in that case, a nation state. Remember that we have never entered global governance before. It would be such a positive sum game. So how do you, let's take Germany, proportional representation. So let's say the CDU is in power with, a, with an amalgamation of other parties and that you've received 20% of the adult vote. So maybe you've received 20% times 40 million, 8 million votes. And yet the global plan authority has just been formed by 2 billion votes. And you're in charge of Germany and you've got 8 million votes. How do you counter that? So we're going past the nation state because we have to do it. And in, by doing so, we force a partial sovereignty ceding of the nation, just a partial one. We're not going to get rid of nations. We're not going to get rid of full nation sovereignty, but we're going to force them to give up a part just so that we get that function of utility that we must have. Who are the people who just look at you mm. like you're mad? Mad. Yeah. The five billion of us who are going to be connected in 2022 just 33 years after Berners-Lee wrote HTML, are formed out of an incredibly strong Venn diagram. Um, we're going to allow anyone who's 13 years and older to vote. So, and th that, th the reason for that is more analogous to admit the teenagers um, than include them. Well, they're certainly the ones. They're they certainly the ones. Who care about they, they, they their have, legacy they have Earth for when they're older. You're so right. They have, they have a multiple of attributes. But history, they were there when we kicked out Louis XVI. They were there with Sun Yat-sen. They were there with Gandhi. They were there with Luther King. Um, they were there with Washington and Payne. They were always there at points of revolutionary human history, like a, like a large thing like forming the nation state. So they must be there again. And of course, they had the most to benefit uh, by a healthy biosphere. So. Um, of those 5 billion, 2 billion will be, um, this is 5 billion people connected, 2 billion will be 13 to 30. The second group is Greater Asia, Mumbai to Tokyo, Shanghai to Jakarta. That's 2.5 billion connected. I'm not talking about the total population, I'm talking about the, the connected population. And there there's great... Um, I think, uh, insight because Confucianism is back in China and Confucius taught us that we must um, uh, respect the ritual and, and not uh, covet the goat. And we have no ritual for caring for the planet. So it's a very Confucius angle. And the Indus population believes that you should not harm any living thing or think of harm any, any living thing. And of course, we know that Gaia is a living thing. So it's a very Hindu action as well to form that. Then there's another two. There's two and a half billion women and two and a half billion men. And you add all of those up, of course, it's a Venn diagram making fun. And I think this is a very female act. Um, universal suffrage is only 30 to 80 years old. So this would be a reinforcement of universal suffrage. But the inherent intergenerational care that women have uh, can be embodied in this institution. 
And lastly, two and a half billion men. And you may wonder why I've left men to last. So in my experience of giving this talk over the last two years, the kids are in. I think the Asian community I've come across are in. The women are in. And who do I get the arms crossing? It's typically men over 50 years old. They're going, ah, oh, you know, this is not the structure that we built. Um, you know, this, it's very, you can't just walk past the nation state. And there are a lot of variables here. How do you build an international taxation system? How do you have the power of enforcement, really? Is two billion people going to go on strike? Who is indigenous in the Amazon Iranian forest and who is not? How do you administer a $125 a tonne carbon tax? Um, how do you divert the satellites so that every ship is, and this is called the fog of war. The single human mind cannot compute all the variables of a global multi-front war. So your brain can't do it. So you have to get over that opposition. But I think if I could be a little bit harsh, men over 50 have the most difficulty, have the most difficulty overcoming that obstacle. Any particular demographic profile? I wouldn't want to say that. <laughs> I mean, I'm just curious. I mean, obviously I'm a white male over 50, over 50 and, and, um, and most of my talks have included white men over 50. So but if I had to be... you might be a more unique and a bit uh, more... I don't think so. It's interesting, though. I was working out the other day, Taz. In my book, I write as an introduction that I'm WWMMMM. I'm white, Western, male, middle class and married. And I worked that out as what percentage of the world's population am I if I fit that? And it's 1%. If you're white, Western, male, middle class and married, you're 1% of the global population. So let's not care about us, right? For the rest of you listening out there, just vote it into place and forget the white males. <laughs> but I mean, I'm guessing the whole concept in itself transcends gender, it yeah. transcends race. I mean, we are talking about the global survival of humanity. Well, we're being told that by our ecological leaders, aren't we? Where um, Attenborough said that what we do in the next 50 years will affect all life on the planet. Uh, Hawkins said we must replace uh, the operating system within two decades. He said that in 2009, so we're one decade in and we haven't changed. Um, the National Academy of Sciences said when they reported on the insect decimation that humanity's got two decades to change its whole approach to running the biosphere. So we've got clear instruction. We face clear and present danger right now. And in terms of biophysical time, given that the Holocene was 11,000 years and the Anthropocene is 250 years, yeah, it's right now that we need to change. So in your research, Angus, and through what you've learned, how long have we got? I don't know the answer to that because I'm not a, a, a specialist. What, I, what excites me is that thanks to our connectivity, similar to the invention of the printing press in the 1450s, which um, when a lot of luminaries asked who was the most important person to live in the last millennium? And their number one answer by far was the inventor of the printing press. I believe that the inventors of the internet, smartphones and computers are that equivalent now. They have given us the capacity to determine our own future, our connectivity. So we can now enter that void for the very first time. That opportunity did not exist at the end of the First World War because we didn't have the connectivity, so we created the League of Nations, which was just a meeting room. It didn't exist at the end of the Second World War. We created the UN, which is just a meeting room. But now, as we decimate the biosphere, we have that opportunity to move. So when can we vote? Well, um, people ask me that. And I would, I, my best guess is that we will hold this vote in the next five to 10 years, because it's 60 years after Carson, 30 years after Berners-Lee, and now we know. I believe we're 80% of the way to creating this authority because we know the problem at the global level and we're now connected at the global level. So I believe those two preconditional factors mean we are 80% of the way. There's a, 
uh, disjuncture. We have a global asset. The human race is now a global power. And yet we're relying on the fractured nation state system who don't talk to each other often enough, who are wary of each other to deliver us that function of utility. 50 years after the 1972 UN meeting of Stockholm that declared that the natural assets of the world must be protected, we have seen an accelerating descent into biophysical hell simply because of that mismatch. Global asset, fractured national system. You've got to match the global asset with the global enforcement. Well, thank you, Angus. I mean, certainly as a woman who loves this planet and loves nature, I really pray that we all do come together to save our environment. So do I. Thanks, Taz.